I would love to welcome everyone to Drisha's Winter's Man and the second part of a two-part series, How Much Do You Bench? Quantitative and Qualitative Perspectives on Birkat Hamazon by Rabbi, Rabbi Dr. Shlomo Zakir. Rabbi Dr. Zakir teaches in the Dr. Beth Samuels High School Program and the Drisha Summer Kolel, as well as other Drisha programs. A postdoctoral fellow in Jewish studies at McGill University, he received his PhD in Ancient Judaism at Yale University and was a member of Yeshiva University's Kolel Elyon. Previously, he served as director of the Orthodox Union's Jewish Learning Initiative on campus at Yale University. He is an alumnus of Yeshivat Haaretzion and Ritz, as well as of the Wexner and Tikva Fellowships. He has lectured and taught widely across North America, as well as at Yale Divinity School, Yeshiva University, the Tikva Fund, and Benot Sinai. A founder of the Lair House, he serves on the editorial committee of tradition and has edited two books on contemporary Jewish thought. And without further ado, Rabbi Dr. Zakir. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, and uh, welcome back to a lot of uh, a lot of familiar faces. I think since since uh, I think we we introduced ourselves last time, we won't we won't go around and do it again. Um, but it's good to see people back. And uh, if last time we talked about some of the larger questions of the the the, the source for benching for Berkat Amazon and the context and the idea of uh, of it being a way of avoiding challenges of being uh, uh, of complacency after being satiated, after being uh, in a comfortable economic position in the land of Israel. Uh, we talked about that a little bit and how benching, re recognizing God, recognizing that my my own wealth, my own well-being is not my own accomplishment, but it really is owed to God. And we also spoke a bit about the uh, biblical derivation or the the Talmudic derivation of the source and the different the different blessings, the different brachot that all are incorporated or all, all are drawn from uh, this one verse of you eat, you're satiated, and you bless God. And we see that that built from one one blessing to a second to a third. Moses uh, Moshe had a uh, had one of the uh, one of those brachot and Yoshua and David and Shlomo the third and the fourth as late as uh, as the second century CE according to the uh, to the Talmud and then we also saw that other other blessings are incorporated as well including the uh, the blessing before food right uh, which is a, from a Kalva Homer a uh, an argument that, you know how could it be that you bless after and not before which was, it was a little complicated but we we discussed that and maybe even the blessing on studying Torah is is connected and related in some way. So uh, because this this one case is is seen as maybe the only or maybe the, at least the the central biblical commandment to bless, we saw how that expanded in various directions uh, as to what appreciation one should have. To, and then we looked a little bit at the content of those of those blessings as well. Um, today our goal is to uh, is to ask a lot of questions about what qualify someone or what requires someone uh, to have to express that that blessing to have to bench um, how much do you bench what what situation do you have to be in in order to have that uh, the obligation of birkat amazon and we're going to ask that from a couple of different perspectives first the quantity of food how much one has to eat and what that may reflect um, and then also the question of what types of foods and i think uh you know people who who have some familiarity with Jewish law may know what the uh, you know the final answers are, sort of what's the the conclusions. But I think the discussions and the analyses uh, along the way to get us there will be will be very insightful as well. And actually, we'll end with a uh, with a particular practical angle, a question of maybe some of our study today will allow us to reevaluate and to think about how we might practice uh, somewhat differently nowadays. Um, okay. I see there's a question in the chat about uh, mixing uh, meat and milk. We're not going to get into that question. The, there are many, many laws uh, involving Jews and food. In fact, the whole this whole two-week Drisha program is all about that, and everyone's encouraged to sign up for other classes there. Um, and you know the kosher laws are a major part of that, um, but that's not that's not the goal of our class uh, our class today. But certainly something to uh, you know to to think about and study more generally. Um, all right, so. Why don't we why don't we jump in? We're going to focus on really two two Talmudic discussions, um, each of which appears in multiple places in the Talmud and in later literature, to try to answer these questions of what what leads one to be required uh, to bench. And as I think I mentioned at the outset last time, this is going to tie into issues of subjective versus objective experience. Uh, and as we saw last time, that's important, right? Because the idea here. Is you you eat your full, then there's a risk 
and that's why one should bless. So, so to what extent is that formalized, or does what to what extent does that depend on the person? Um, and um, okay, so why don't we why don't we jump into the to the sources? I think you all should have gotten the uh, the handout in the link, but we'll also share screen and. Uh, um, I guess I should add everyone's invited again to, uh, to join uh, visually, to, to turn on their cameras if they're comfortable doing that. And for people who prefer not prefer, you know, I don't know, split screen or different things, there are different ways of setting that up. You can close the shared screen and open and uh, open your handout uh, independently. So figure out the setup that works best for you. Um, but here we go with the shared screen. And uh, I also try to get as many, uh, try to adjust the screen so I can see as many people uh, whose cameras are on as possible, which sometimes works better than other times. So give me a moment here. Um, you know, it's always uh, tricky. You want to, you want, you want the experience to be uh, as personal as possible, but also for people to see the the source sheet. Um, let me see, is this letting me do this? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So let's jump in. And uh, again, our first question is going to be this this issue of the quantity of food. How much food does one need to eat in order to bench? In order to have this obligation? To bless God uh, in Birkat Hamazon, and uh, this this comes up in a Mishnah, a very a very short line, a one one off a line in the Mishnah. Ad kama mizamnim. Um, until what point do we do zimun? And this is understood not just as about zimun, as about the as we saw last time, the blessing prior to the blessing after the meal. It presumably means not just zimun, but also uh, Birkat Hamazon. How how much does one need to eat in order to bench? Ad kezayit until as much as until one eats as much as an olive's bulk, right? A kezayit, uh, the the size of an olive, that is sufficient uh, to make one obligated in benching. That's the unattributed opinion. The Tanakama Rabbi Yehuda Omer Ad kebeitz Yehuda says it has to be an egg size. Generally, um, their both uh, their eggs were were probably smaller than our eggs because they had uh, uh, I don't know they they pumped the eggs with fewer chemicals and such. So their eggs were about twice the size of their olives. Um, back then. So that's the general understanding. An egg's volume is about twice that of an olive. Whatever it is, we're not talking about a huge amount of food, right? And uh, in terms of if you want to jump to super practical for a second, generally people understand that, you know, uh, a kazite is maybe a slice of bread, because if you crumble it up, you know, bread is sort of uh, uh, full of air. If you crumble it up, you get about an olive size, maybe even less than that, but there, you know, uh, there are different views on it. But let's say something around a slice of bread is, is a kazite. Fine. So the, the view here, the, there are two views here. Uh, at one point, does one have to bench after eating one slice of bread or one kezite or uh, double that, an egg size? Okay, sounds very nice. What on earth is this dispute about? So the Gemara, uh, several dapim later, the Gemara gets into a little bit of detail trying to discuss what the issue is here. Um, and um, for those for those who prefer English, the, the passage we're about to look at is Brachot 49b. So Google you can uh, search for Brachot 49b Safaria. They should hopefully have have uh, some English to follow with. But uh, we're going to make sure to translate everything closely, so uh, you know it shouldn't be it, it should be very possible to follow uh, like this as well. Fine. So Ad Kamim is Amnim. The Gemara starts off by saying Lememra de Rabbi Meir Chashiv Lei Kizayit Rabbi Yehuda So it uh, uh, so it says the Gemara says it seems like we have according to what we just saw the main view, which it attributes to Rabbi Meir believes that a kezayit, eating an olive size, is sufficient to, to be a meal. Whereas Rabbi Yehuda says in uh, a kebetz, an, uh, a, an egg size. But if Hashem the only problem is, we know from elsewhere that uh, that they have the opposite positions. And we're not going to get into this in detail. We'll just quickly run through. The Tanan v'chein mishi yatsam yerushalayim in his karsha yabi adob b'sar kodesh. Someone who leaves Jerusalem has a, a certain amount of meat with them. You're supposed to eat this meat in Jerusalem. Im avart sofim, if you leave the outskirts of the, the area of Tzofim, then you have to burn it. Fine, if not, you go back and burn it in your, whatever it is. The, the details there, uh, leave them aside. How much meat do you need to go back for to burn? How much meat counts as a sufficient amount of meat that you'd have to go back and burn it in this case? The exact opposite of what they just said in our mission. Rabbi Meir says not an olive, but an, an egg. Rabbi says not an egg, but an olive. So what is their view as to uh, determining what like a basic unit of food is, right? We seem to have two different views and they seem to be at cross purposes. They seem to say opposite things in opposite places. Something seems wrong. No, the opinion's backwards. So swap, presumably this one we just mentioned, swap the order and Rameir actually says an olive consistently and Rabbi Huda says an egg consistently, right? So you have, when you have a contradiction, you got the names wrong probably. You got confused and really they agree, fine. 
But now, uh, getting back to our our purposes, Abai says, Abai Amr, the Olam lo You don't need to switch the opinion. Hacha bekrai pligi. There's two different discussions here. One question is about, you know, food and impurity, and that's a whole other thing. But the other question in our Mishnah, it's about, it's bekrai pligi. It's a dispute about how to read a verse, and not just any verse, but how to read the verse that we studied in depth two days ago. The verse of, you eat, you're full, you should bless God. How, how should one properly read and understand that verse? So, okay, what's the dispute? Um, so, hacha uh, bikrai pligi, Rabbi Meir Savar, ve'achalta, zo'achila, you eat. That means eating, right, pretty straightforwardly. Visavata, you're full. Zo'shtia, that's drinking. Okay, that's interesting. That's not, not obvious at all, that, that being full means drinking. Uh, and then, ve'achila, because I eat. Simple, standard, usually the default assumption is eating is an olive size. That's sort of with the, throughout Jewish law, throughout halacha, the default assumption is eating like a basic unit is considered eating a kezayit. So you have eating of drinking and the eating amount is a kezayit. Very simple. That's Rabbi Meir's view. Rabbi Yehuda Savar, v'achaltav v'savata. No, you have to read the two together. You eat and they're full. It doesn't just mean you eat and they're full. It means you eat enough to be satiated. V'achaltav v'savata, achila sheyesh basvi'a. Eating that has within it, that that's uh, that entails being satiated. The ezozo kebetza. So eating would usually be an olive size, but to be full, you need an, an egg size, right? You eat, you know, if you eat one slice of bread, you can say you're eating. You're not just snacking, you're eating it with one slice of bread. If you eat two slices of bread, then you're actually, then you're actually going to be full, at least in a standard case. Okay, so that's the dispute here. And this is a by continuing his explanation. Hatam there, bisvara plige. They have a dispute about logic, a logical reasoning. And um, we're not going to go into the details there. It's about whether returning is the same standard, uh, re- whether one has to return to Jerusalem to burn it there or burn it where they are. Does that have the same standard as determining the minimum size for something to become impure or not? Side issue, not related to us. But what comes out here, according to Abaye, well, there's two different renditions of what this dispute is about, right? One rendition is that this is simply a question of how does one defi- define the minimal size of food? What is food? What's the minimal amount of food? Is it an olive size or an egg size? Simple question. The other view uh, that we just saw at some length from Abaye is that everyone agrees that nor- that food, you know, normal food in, in general is a minimum at minimum an olive size. But here for benching, you need to eat not just food, you need to eat enough food to be satiated. The verse says you need to be satiated. So the minimum is not eating. The minimum is being full. And the amount one needs to eat to be full is not just a, uh, not just an olive size, but an egg size. And you need a kibbeit, so you need twice as much. Um, okay, so that's already interesting, right? If you ask, if you now take a step further back, right, and say, what is the trigger? What phenomenon, what experience is the trigger for Birkat Amazon for benching? We really have two different views here, in a, in, you know, not just in a technical way, but in a very fundamental way. Is benching a function of, or is the obligation to bench a function of eating, or is it a function of being full? Right? It seems like the first view we had, that's just like the question is, do you, you know, is eating a kazait or is eating a kibetza, um, that there, then it's just a question of, of eating because that's all you need. Eating is benching. You know, if you eat, you have to bench. Whereas Abaye's view, it seems like, according to, according to Rabbi Mayer, at least, there is this idea that you need to be full, you need to be satiated to, uh, to have this obligation to bench. Now, why might that be? What, what might undergird each of these reasons? I think one's probably more obvious than the other, but uh, why, why don't... Uh, we take some suggestions. How would we explain each of these uh, reasonings? Or what's the goal of Birkat Amazon? A Yehudi, yeah. I think what you said on Monday was right on, that this is really more predictive than, than prescriptive. In other words, it's like, how do you look upon Bishamachta V'chagecha? Is that prescriptive or predictive? There's a big argument about that between Rashi and Avram Ibn Ezra. A plain toss-up shot is predictive, so that means that you'll if you if you are full, then you will bless. Okay, and obviously you got to eat more than an egg or a olive to become full, as I just sent it on the chat. In other words, clearly what's happening here is simply using the pasuk to start something going. This is not what the Pusik actually says, okay? It's simply the Pusik is just a platform you use to jump off to the rabbinical, which is what's going on in all Masecha Prochot. I mean, there's not one thing in this whole Masecha that has a firm 
ground in Tanakh. It's everything in it is basically taking whatever the Tanakh has and and. Okay, you are you are you trying to explain the the quest the answer to the question of why why it would be eating or or uh, being full? In other words, how do you get full from eating an olive or an egg? Well, that's a different question. Um, right. I think that that's a question of. I think, first of all, the question of how to define being full, um, maybe full doesn't mean like you can't eat anymore. Maybe being full means you basically have eaten enough to get you to the next meal. That's one possibility. Also, we should keep in mind that um, the world we live in where there's a lot, you know, there's more food than, you know, there's at least in America, let's say, we have a lot more food than we know what to do with. Um, we, I mean, on a whole, not right there, obviously are individuals who don't have food, which is a problem. But as a, as a society, we throw out so much food. We have some, right, so for us, you can eat a lot, and uh, and we are used to eating a lot. Back uh, back in the day, where people had less money, there was uh, you know, and and it was so. hard. They were eating less. So I think I I, I wouldn't question. I, Gemara, I think the Gemara has a better perspective than we do right, uh, right. on what at least at the time what would have made someone full. Although there is some flexibility in terms of what exactly being full means. So let's leave that aside. I want to I want to ask another question, and someone who who can I'd love someone to answer this specific question, which is, why would you why would you make Birkat Amazon dependent on eating and, or versus, why would you make Birkat Amazon dependent on being satiated? We could take this grammatically and say that the achalta is a future tense, which could be taken as a tzivui, which you just said that, you know, there's a dispute about that, but let's take it as a tzivui, for example, now. And so the achalta, if it's a tzivui, then it's a commandment, then you have to eat. Visavata is it's like this weird perfect tense you will have been satisfied but it's not in command lashon so therefore maybe it doesn't have anything to do with the mitzvah uh-huh interesting so you want to you want to ask the question you, you're looking at it grammatically more like the gemara itself did right is the is the achila and the svia the eating and the being satiated are those connected or are those two separate things so the gemara said is it eating versus is it eating and being full connected to the eating or is it eating and drinking separate you're suggesting another possibility that one's a command and one's not um although i don't i don't see chazal saying there's a commandment to eat i mean obviously you have to keep yourself healthy and well but I, there's no problem with uh, fasting for example even you know fasting uh, uh voluntarily there's no problem it's not like you're violating a commandment to eat uh, according to the rabbis but i think i think your question is definitely one way of looking at it right you can look at it exegetically and grammatically is eating and being full connected to one another or you know sort of either one or is even even eating it itself is a trigger. That's definitely one way uh, of understanding. Um, Jonathan, did you want to say something before? Um, I was going to suggest that um, the opinion that says it's eating at all is is possibly saying that um, any benefit is worth guarding against the complacency and everything else. And the other one is saying that it. Um, a benefit of a certain level is what we're worried about. Okay, so John, John, you want to suggest that really everyone agrees that the worry here is about the complacency factor, right? You, you, you'll eat or however much you eat, it'll be enough that you'll be complacent. And the question is where to draw the line. Like, would we worry about complacency at a kazayis? Would we worry about complacency at a kibetza? Right, it's sort of a question where to draw the line, but both views think it's about complacency. I think you can, you can set this up potentially as a question of, is Birkana Mazon about appreciating the food that you ate period, simpliciter, right? The very fact that you ate food that comes from God is cause for thanking God and appreciating that. And that's a, a kazai, any eating that's defined as eating, even an olive size, if it's considered like eating a meal, eating food, you thank God for that, that's the obligation. Whereas uh, the, the view that believes that one needs to be satiated, one needs a kibetza to be full, that view might hold, like John, like you were saying just now, that it's really, it's not just thanking God, I meaning God giving you something itself isn't, I mean, it, it's oh, it's definitely a reason to thank God, but it's not a re it's not sufficient for creating a full commandment. There's only a commandment to thank God when one's more worried about the complacency, about becoming, uh, you know, eating and being full and being uh, becoming lazy and forgetting about God. Maybe on that view, it's more we're more worried about the next step, about complacency and forgetting about God, and that's why you need to not just eat but be full. So maybe these are two different questions, two different angles overall. Meaning, is benching about appreciating what we have? Or is it more preventive to avoid falling into certain traps? Like I think last time we focused on that second approach, but uh, you know it's not at all obvious. One could simply say that that eat benching is, is thanking God for what one eat one ate. Um, okay, um, great. 
So uh, I see a few comments in the in the in the chat. Um, yeah, we're not. I don't think they're going to help uh, move our discussion forward right now. So, but so we won't get into them. Um, but um, you know, feel free. Everyone should feel free to research further details of this and be in touch with me offline uh, to make sure that we're uh, we're doing everything uh, uh, you know in proper historical context. Um, I spent a bunch of years training on how to do that, so I'm not too worried about that. Let's focus on on getting these ideas and thinking them through together. All right, so let's jump now. We just saw the Gemara, the Mishnah and Gemara. There's two views. What makes one, what, you know, uh, leads one to be obligated to bench, eating a, an olive or an egg. And those both might be amounts of how much food one needs to eat, or it might be that the kibetza is about one needing to be full. Compare that with this other Gemara that we're about to look at that seems to point in a different direction. Gemara on Daf Kaf, um, uh, you know, a few dozen pages earlier. And again, this, this should be, uh, accessible on Safaria also, Brachot 20b. Um, so let's read. Darash Rav Avira. Rav Avira gave the, the following drasha, the following uh, sermon or homily. Okay, so that already, we can mark that as a bit unusual, right? It's not, it sounds like he's not, uh, it may, this may be not a legal text, but somewhat more of a homiletical text. And we'll see what, 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 that hap what happens with that. So he says as follows. He alternatively cited it in the name of Ami or Asi. Maybe he wasn't sure who said it. Amru The ministering angels said before God, before the Holy One, blessed be He. Ribono Shalom, Master of the World. It says in the Torah that God, you're so great, you don't show favoritism and you don't take bribes. Okay, that's God. That's part of your nature. That's that's uh, God. You don't take bribes. You don't favor people. But it also says that you favor Israel. Right, this is in the priestly blessing. May God turn His face towards you, or show you favoritism, and uh, give you peace. So, what does that mean? God doesn't show favoritism, but then we bless people that God should favor them, and the Torah says we should do that. So, presumably, it's a good thing if God favors uh, favors people and gives them peace. So, what's the story? Uh, and, and we'll see how this gets the benching in a second. Amar lahem panim li Israel. So he said to them, meaning God responded to the ministering angels, I, what, I should, this is God's, this is how we know God is Jewish, because he answers a question with a question. He says, what, I shouldn't show favoritism to Israel? I wrote for them in the Torah. I wrote in the Torah, when do you bench? You eat, you're full, and then you bench, then you have to bless God. That's that's what I said, God. And they said, no, we're going to go further than that. We're going to go even further. We don't need, uh, we don't need a, a, we don't need to wait until we're full to bless God. We'll bless God even when eating an olive size or an egg size. Less than that, that's enough reason to say that, uh, that we need to bless God. So first of all, this is like a super cool text, right? That uh, God favors Israel precisely because Israel is willing to go above and beyond in, in blessing God and sort of God returns the favor, I guess preemptively though, right? Because it says, Yisash and Panavi Lecha came before, uh, but whatever it is, forget about the, the chronology for a second, right? The idea here uh, is what we're focusing on. And, um, and so there's a lot of interesting things here, right? So God favors Israel specifically because of benching. Why? Maybe that's because this is the, again, this is a clear case of blessing, of, of people uh, blessing God. Uh, we spoke about that a little bit last time. What does it mean to bless God? Does God need it? Presumably not. So how do you understand it? However you understand it, though, God appreciates it and uh, returns the favor, literally, by favoring Israel. Yisa Hashem panavi lecha. But what, hap what happens now when we try to correlate source number three with source number two? Brachot dafkav with brachot memtet. There's a problem here. The problem is that uh, at the end of the day, what is the obligation? Uh, at what stage is there an obligation to bench? How much does one need to eat? We now have a third opinion from source number three. It seems like there's a third opinion that goes against what we saw in source number two in terms of the basic biblical obligation, uh, in terms of the basic biblical obligation for benching. What is that? Right, source number three. If I were to ask you, summarize and very quickly, what is the minimum shear? What's the minimum amount one needs to eat in order to be biblically required to bench? Not what people did on their own as like a bonus, but the basic biblical requirement. What's that? What is that? It's both in 
Kazite as uh, possibilities? Well, sort of, right? It says Kazite and Kvetsai's possibilities of what they do, but hey, Medak to Kim Alatzman, they're extra stringent with themselves. But that's yeah. not what the Torah says, right? Again, according to God, and I guess God is a decent expositor of the Torah, according to God, what the Torah says is only only when you're full do you have that obligation. But they, you know, those Jews, they go, ex they're extra stringent. They say, even if you just eat a kazai, or even if you just eat a kvetsa, and you're not full, that's still reason enough. So it sounds like, it sounds like we have a third opinion here, meaning God's opinion, right? Not what people did, not the stringency of people, but the basic law prior to that stringency is that one needs to be full. It's about the straightforward reading of the verse, right? One needs to actually be full. And presumably, this source seems to indicate, this is maybe what Yehudi was getting at before, but this source seems to indicate that eating a kibetza is not sufficient, or eating a kibetza, there neither of those are sufficient for being full, right? That's somehow a lower standard, or at least a different standard, maybe it depends on the case. But a usual, usually, one would, you know, sort of a fundamentally, biblically, one would need to be full to have the obligation to bench. And then people are extra stringent that even if they're not full, as long as they eat a kazai or a they still have to bench. Um, they still make themselves bench. But we have a real problem here, which is what is the biblical requirement? Is the biblical requirement kazai or a that dispute that we talked about before, or is it being full, right? And, and again, getting back to one of the themes we mentioned before, this is a question of objective versus subjective, right? Because being full, I don't know, it depends on the situation, right? If you had a big breakfast, you need to eat less at lunch to be full. If you skip breakfast, then you need to eat more to be full, right? That's very subjective. Whereas a kazai and is, is very much objectified, right? It's a certain, I mean, you know, however, whatever your standard is, however many ounces or whatnot your kazai and your kibetza is, you have, a, you have an answer. You have a, a specific amount that one needs to eat. It doesn't vary based on person. It doesn't vary based on situation. It's objective. So what do we do with this? How do we reconcile these two sources? Uh, any thoughts or any ideas? Okay, Yehudi, if it, if it answers this question. Let's say a person goes ahead and says, the whole brichat is on over half an hour. Isn't that a brachat Presumably, yeah, that would be a, a wasted well, or don't unnecessary. Don't you think it's a bit of pushing the bracha idea a little much to basically have a person not only encouraged, but required to say this entire geschichte over such a small amount of food. I mean, that shows a disrespect for brachot. Okay, well, I, I think, um, uh, you know, I respect your position, but uh, based on what we just saw, God disagrees. So I'm going to go with God on this one, um, at least according to source number three, right? God seems pretty happy that people are going the extra mile with, with the bracha. And I think, so I think we're going to have to, we're going to have to talk about this a little bit. I mean, before we even get to your question, um, we have to figure out how how sources two and three interact. Meaning at the end of the day, it sounds like there's a contradiction, right? Source number two makes it sound like the actual biblical obligation of benching is a kazayda kvetsa. And, and how do you know this? Because they're they're fighting it out over verses. They're interpreting the Torah like any other biblical commandment. Source number three makes it sound like, no, the actual biblical commandment is being full. And then the kazayda kvetsa is some stringency that people have and that rabbis codify, but not as, as a mitzvah do right, not as the biblical law, but as some extra thing that people took on. So we need to first figure out um, who's right. You know, which of these sources is determinative before we can go forward and ask your question, Yudi, because right, if, if the um, if the objective, if the answer of when does one bench is anytime one eats a kazayit, objectively one is obligated to bench, then I, I see no, in source number three, uh, the, the question doesn't even get off the ground. So let's try to figure that out. And we're going to look at a couple of different approaches in the Rishonim, in the medieval, uh, in the medieval uh, commentaries and sources. And uh, it's helpful whenever you resolve a contradiction between sources, it's helpful often to keep in mind um, what uh, Professor Chaim Soloveitchik uh, often says that usually you have, you have different Talmudic approaches. Um, one of your sources, one of them will be sort of chosen as like the guiding principle. And you sort of can reinterpret all the other sources in light of that main one. So often you'll have, you know, you'll have uh, two or more conflicting Talmudic views. You'll have different interpretations among the Rishonim. And at the end of the day, what they're really arguing about is which source is the, you know, which of the Talmudic sources is the main one and which one do you have to reinterpret it in light of that? I think this will be another example of that, as we'll see. So source number four here is Tosvot. Tosvot, uh, as is their want, uh, they're very, uh, very often they'll say, the Talmud says this here, but it says that there. How do we resolve the contradiction? Right? It's called a dialectical approach. So they'll take this, I'll take that, and they'll, uh, they'll pit them against each other and then try to resolve it. So let's jump in. Rimeir Sarachotazo Achila. The Achila Right, we saw this before. Source number two 
uh, right? The verse says, eat. If you eat, you eat, and you have to bless God. Eating is a kezayit. That's our general definition. Okay, the Omer Hari, the Ri, of Isaac of Dampier, the main character in Tosfot, he, he, he says as follows. Tahani kroi asmachta be'alma ninhu. These verses, I thought these verses were, were interpreting what the Torah means, right? It's about doing the, uh, figuring out what the chiv da'araita is, what the biblical commandment is. He says, no, it's just an asmachta. Asmachta is like a, sort of like a hook in the sense you, you hang something on it. You lean, you lean your interpretation on a verse, but the verse is actually not the source, right? It's more like a reminder um, or uh, some connection to your teaching, but the teaching is actually not biblical. The teaching is post-biblical and it uses a verse uh, to, to lean on. Um, so he says that this, this whole discussion of which Pusik you're using and what, whether it's a Kezayit or a Kameit, so that's not really, uh, it's not really based on those verses. Those verses are just a, an Asmachta. Why? Biblically, you need to actually be full. As we just saw in the previous source, right? God says, I'm so happy the Jews go above and beyond instead of benching only on being full, they bench on a Kezayit or a Kebetza. So it, that, that implies that one actually needs to be full. Um, so th that's why that source number two is is uh, is not really what it seems. It's not a biblical discussion. It's a it's an asmachta. And source number three about being uh, about uh, being full is the actual uh, trigger for the obligation. Finally, there's another indication from a different Talmudic passage that seems to imply that one can eat an amount to be rabbinically obligated to bench and not biblically, which would be eating a kezayit but not being full. And he has Rashi to rely on in Pierce Rashi, Hainu Kazaidu Kavetsa, depending on your view, fine. Um, and uh, and he says, how can we even talk about a rabbinic minimum for benching if if the minimum is a Kazaid or Kabetza? That's the biblical minimum, then what's the rabbinic minimum? So he has various textual proofs to his view that really it's all about being full. And that, that Midaraita, biblically, and then Midarabanan, rabbinically, there's this extra stringency. Uh, of uh, even after one has a kezayit or kibetza, and God's very happy about that, but that's not the biblical law. Um, fine. And uh, fine, he says, v'kaimlan b'kezayit, right? We had our debate, an olive or an egg. How do we rule? We rule a kezayit. So the rule is, if you eat a kezayit, if you have, a, a, you know, a, enough of a kezayit, let's say a slice of bread, you therefore, uh, you therefore are obligated in birkat hamazon. Um, fine, the female shem machle from Yochanan, kamer of Yehuda v'kezayit. Fine, he works through the sugya before in the names, and who we would follow, we like following Rabbi Yochanan, um, even though we usually follow Rabbi Yehuda over Rabbi Meir, but here we go, Rabbi Yochanan, we're not going to go into all those details. Um, fine, and he wrote, V'chein Pasak Bahag, V'rach, V'she'iltot, other people rule like this as well, it's a Kezai. This is the, the you know, the uh, uh, formalized halacha, this is the general view one should just be aware of, and then he says, in terms of drinking, how much does one need to drink in order to have to make a, a bracha chrona, to have a blessing afterwards? Um, fine, we're not going to get into the details there. There's different views of how much one needs to drink to have to make a, a blessing following drinking, whether it's uh, it's a reviet, uh, say three out three fluid ounces, or whether it's lo lugmav, one's mouth being full. And there's a whole question as to um, what's the relation between a reviet and lo lugmav, and which one's bigger. We're not going to get into all those things. Um, but uh, fine, leave that aside. It's clear what Tosvot does, right? We have a contradiction. Is the minimal amount for benching eating a, a, an egg or uh, an olive size, or is it about being full? And the answer is, Tosvot says, it's really about being full. And this source is not what you think it is. It's not teaching you the biblical obligation. It's an asmach that's teaching you, uh, you know, different mnemonics, different verses to remember the view, but the actual view is being full. Um, okay, let's move to another approach, another resolution, and then, and then I'll take some questions. So source number five, this is the Rambam in his code, Mishnah Torah, with the comment of the Ravid, Ravid, uh, uh, maybe a generation or two after the Rambam, and he, his uh, comments, his early comments, uh, were lucky enough to be encoded on the page right next to the Rambam. On this one, oddly enough, um, I think the Rambam, the Ravid, whoever put in the Ravid, at least on the edition I was looking at, put him on the previous halacha, but I, I adjusted it to here. Fine. So uh, the Rambam says here, he's talking about our issue, when one has to bench, you have a group of people who um, who ate, and they were not full, and they, uh, let's take here, to mean rabbinically, rabbinically, they're rabbinically and not biblically obligated to bench, why? Because they ate, but were not full. 
So again, Tos, uh, Rambam here is, is agreeing with Tosfot that eating and uh, not being full one's only rabbinically, not biblically obligated to bench. And then he gets into the details there of if one's only rabbinically obligated, then kids might be able to make one be yotze or a slave or whatever exactly the case is, uh, complicates the story. That's the Rambam's view. The Rambam comes out like Tosfot. He doesn't explain why, presumably for the same reason, presumably based on the Gemara and Daf Kaf, he reevaluates the Gemara and Daf Memtet. But now here comes the Ravid. Um, Rabbi Abraham ben David of Pasquiaris in, uh, in uh, yeah, uh, in uh, Provence. So he says as follows, These are not as proper. This is wrong. Um, and these are not agreeable in the halacha, in the, in the final uh, conclusion. So why, why is that? What's the problem? We hold, we have established we, we have a very clear view that if one eats an olive or an egg's worth of food, one is obligated com, ob, obligated biblically to bench. Because as we saw in our source, um, in source number two, it says you do, or in source number one actually, right? you do a zimun, meaning you do the pre-benching blessing with uh, after eating kazaid or kibetza, and presumably that means you can also bench biblically uh, after having only a kazaid or a kibetza. Um, right, the only, the only view that says this whole thing about being full is Rav Avira. Remember Rav Avira? We just saw him. Rav Avira was source number, uh, where do you go? Source number three, Darash Rav Avira, right? Rav Avira has this weird idiosyncratic view that a Kazai and a Kibetza is not, is not the minimal, is not the biblical commandment. He has some odd view. That's just his personal view. That's not, that's not authoritative. We don't, we don't rule like that. Um, et cetera. He has, he has all these proofs from a, a different Gemara and he has a proof for you to be your Shalmi. He has a proof from your Shalmi. He thinks that Rav Avira's view is idiosyncratic. We can add another, another reason to the Ravid. What, what else? What do people want to throw in there? Why else might we think that Rav Avira's view is less than fully authoritative here? I mean, as you hinted, uh, it begins with an idiosyncratic verb. Right, it starts with Darash, Rav Avira. Rav Avira offered a homiletical uh, reflection, right? It's, it doesn't, if you, read, if you read it in context, it doesn't sound like, right, compare sources two and three. Source two, you have a mission that says, this is the halacha, this is the view, or two different views, a kezai kibetza, and then the Gemara discusses what's the source. It's very much legally focused. Um, and, uh, and then Rav Avira, if you look at Rav Avira, it's not like that at all. It's not, it's not based on an exegetical analysis and prior legal statements that contradict whatever. It's, it's presented as a, as a story, as a, you know, uh, 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 an agada, something that happened and, um, you know, angel with angels with God. That, this is not usually the way that we derive halachot. That's right. It's not the standard discourse of halachot. It seems to be something different. So I think, I mean, the writer doesn't say this straight out, but I would, I would assume that this is part of what pushed him to say that Rav Avira is an outlier. You know, maybe it's his idiosyncratic view. Maybe even Rav Avira is only speaking homiletically rather than legally. I mean, it's pretty hard. The mission is pretty clear. It says a Kazai or Kavetsa. And then Rav Avira just says, well, you know, that's a nice thing that people took on, but it's not the biblical. You know, it seems it's a, it's a bit hard to dislodge that basic assumption. So that's the view of the Ravid. And there are others who agree with him as well. But the main view, uh, this, uh, the main view is that of Tosfot. Tosfot and the Rambam and Rashi you have a lot of heavy hitters. Um, who come out and actually rule like Rav Avira, right? Rav Avira is uh, that uh, that one needs to be full to be uh, obligated in benching and biblically. Rabbinically, one's obligated with the Kazai or Kabetza. There are all sorts of differences between being biblically and rabbinically obligated in uh, traditional Jewish law. Anyone think of one offhand? So we have a, we have a rule of evaluating doubt, evaluating Suffolk. Suffolk del right to the Chumra, Suffolk del Rabban and the Kula, right? This is a traditional when in doubt, it's complicated. That's the Jewish principle about doubt, that it depends. Um, when in doubt about a biblical obligation, one should be stringent. When in doubt about a rabbinic, rabbinic obligation, one uh, should be lenient. So here, it gets a little tricky, but the standard view is that um, in, in terms of benching, generally, a normal case of benching, if one is unsure as to whether one benched, right, you have a whole meal, you know you ate a meal, you don't remember if you benched, and let's say, you know, that was 20 minutes ago, you still can bench, you're still, uh, what, whatnot, it's not like two days later, so then, um, then generally you would bench, because it's a biblical obligation, but what if you only had a kezayit, 
Right? Let's say you remember you only ate, uh, you know, you had, uh, I don't know, you had one slice of bread. You weren't full. You just had enough to, uh, you know, to eat. It was, a, it was a, a significant amount of food, but not enough to be full. So then what do you do if you're in doubt? So then it depends if it's the right or the abundant. That would depend on our very issue. The standard view uh, in, in uh, traditional Jewish law is that um, one is not, one would not, not be biblically obligated and therefore one would be exempt in that case. One would not make, uh, would not bench in a case of doubt. Um, just to give an example. Okay, let's, um, I think we, we're going to skip source number six and um, we'll just take a look at source number seven from the Chinuch. And I think we may have, we, we, we looked at part of this piece in the Chinuch yesterday, but this is a different line where we skipped over it last time. And after that, we'll take some questions, discussion. He says, tasfia, this being full, this satiety, ain't la shir adam. There's no objective amount. It, it depends. Everyone knows when they're full. A righteous person eats to when his soul is satiated. Subsistence, enough to live, enough to make it to the next meal. That's what a righteous person does. So obviously, there's some ascetic tendencies here. We can talk about asceticism, asceticism another time, not mutually agreed upon in Judaism, but certainly one major strand of understanding. Um, fine, but obviously what, what's clear, whether you like asceticism or not, what's clear is that, uh, it's, it is that this is a subjective amount, right? Uh, um, a tzaddik will eat until they're full, which is subjective, and whatever point that is, they have to bench. The Torah will prove to you that one is only biblically obligated after being full. The whole Rav Avira thing, as we just read. Um, jump, jump, skip over that. Uh, I'll discuss this more later. Um, fine, it'll mention a dispute. Fine. So, so far, so much that that's, I think, another indication as to how we rule practically. The Chinuch, who often follows the Rambam, as I mentioned on Monday, here he also follows the Rambam that being full is what makes one obligated in benching. Um, and biblically, and rabbinic ones obligated rabbinically if they eat less. Okay, so let's uh, turn off this shared screen. Um, happy to discuss. Um, yeah, happy to have some questions or discussion or other thoughts, and I see there's some comments here. Again, we're not going to get sidetracked with um, uh, semantics, and but we're happy to discuss that offline. Um, but um, uh, if there are anything, anything that, that pertain more directly to our content, Happy to discuss that now. I see someone raised the question of safek brachot lehakel. We do have a rule uh, in Jewish law of when in doubt, again, as I said, in Judaism, the main rule is when in doubt, it's complicated. There's another rule, a specific rule. Uh, we said before, safek deraita versus safek derabana, biblical versus rabbinic doubts. There's another rule, safek brachot lehakel. When in doubt about a blessing, one is lenient, which generally is understood as saying one doesn't say the blessing. So how does that fit? Presumably that rule is true because 99% of blessings are only rabbinically mandated. But there happens to be one, maybe two, but certainly one blessing that is biblically mandated, at least some of the time, which is, of course, benching. So the standard, the standard understanding is that Savik Brachot Dakel does not apply to benching because it only applies to rabbinic brachot, not biblical brachot, such as benching. So that's a good question. Um, but uh, it, uh, yeah, it, we can, we can uh, parry it uh, in that fashion. Um, and nefesh means appetite in that context. Um, uh, I'm not sure. It's an interesting question. Until their, their appetite is full, or maybe it means uh, in terms of, until their basic um, upkeep, their basic bodily well-being is, is uh, satisfied. I'm not sure. I think you can read it in a couple of different ways. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts um, that anyone wants to have or, or you know, reflections? Uh, or maybe if someone who's been eating wants to bench now, <laughs> I guess. Um, um, okay, if not, we'll go back in, but, uh, you know, we're here, we're, this is interactive, we can discuss, we can even see each other, some of us, so uh, everyone's welcome to, to jump in. I thought the point about um, a person who has eaten and ate a kazayat could be motzi a person who has eaten and is full, was an interesting way of weighing the two criteria. They're great, that, right, that's another way, right, that's another angle you might evaluate if someone's biblically obligated versus rabbinically, right, like if a person's full, biblically obligated, has just a kezayit, on some views, only rabbinically obligated, can one be motzi the other? Um, the way they used to do zimun, nowadays people generally do zimun that you say, you know, say a few things, then everyone benches on their own. 
back in the day, the original practice, the original minhag was that everyone, one person would do the whole benching for everyone. So they do rotan of they do that thing. But then one person would bench out loud and would be motzi everyone else, would fulfill everyone else's obligation through their saying it. So that only works if all the people are obligated on, if the person who's, who's benching is obligated on at least the same level as everyone else, right? So everyone's biblically obligated, good. If everyone's rabbinically obligated, good. If the person benching is only rabbinically obligated, but the people hearing him bench and, and fulfilling the mitzvah of benching are, are biblically obligated, that actually doesn't work, right? You can't, you can't punch up. You can't, uh, I don't know, skip stages, whatever you want to call it, right? So that, that's another, another right? thanks for pointing that out, Susan. That's another uh, ramification of the question of do right and do rabbanan. Okay, other thoughts? All right, let's jump back into the shared screen. And now we're gonna look at the second issue, which is um, not the amount of food, but the type of food. How, uh, not how much food does one need to eat to bench, but what sorts of food lead to, uh, to benching. And I'm guessing, uh, I'm guessing some of you have some ideas about that just from, uh, you know, uh, uh, being around uh, practicing Jews and whatnot, but as I said before, it's a little, it'll be a little more complicated than than what's practiced nowadays. We'll have a few different views here. So, source number eight. Uh, source number eight is a Mishnah, also in Brachot. As you would guess, you know, not surprisingly, tractate Brachot blessings has a lot to say about the blessing one makes after eating. Right? There's a good few chapters there that talk about this. Fine. So, Mishnah Achal Anavim Uteinim Verimonim, and as we remember from last time. Grapes, figs, and pomegranates, these are three of the seven fruits or seven pr uh, pro uh, items of produce that Israel is known for. So if you eat those things, one benches, one blesses after them, three blessings. And when they say three blessings, they mean Birkat Amazon because uh, presumably when this Mishnah was written, originally, the original uh, source of this Mishnah, there were only three blessings in Birkat Amazon. The fourth one was added, we said, at Betar in the, the maybe mid second century. And uh, this Mishnah was probably formulated in some form prior to then. So there are only worth three bracho. It means benching, you know, we don't know what the details, but the point is on this view, Divrei Rabban Gamliel, this is Rabban Gamliel's view. Um, on his view, you bench after eating fruit. Why would he say that? Why would, why would these uh, three fruits and maybe a couple others qualify for benching? What's the logic? Guess, just take a wild guess based on what we saw yesterday. Because these three are related to Israel and benching is specific to Israel? For sure, right? Benching is related to Israel, as we saw, and these are, are the fruits of Israel. And how do we know these are the main pr pr produce of Israel? Because in the same parts that I mentioned that um, these are the seven fruits of Israel, and then later they tell you, Right, it's in, exactly, exactly. exactly. So it all appears in the same context. Right, right, the same verses that say you should bench um, also say uh, also say this is the land of of these seven fruits. It's it's all the same context there. So not unreasonably, uh, Rabbi Gamil says, presumably he mentions these three, but presumably anything on the list, any of those seven, which um, again are wheat and barley, which you know that's bread basically. These three, and what else is there? There's um, there's uh, dates, and there's uh, what am I forgetting? Zayat, olives, right, olives. Okay, great, right. So if one would eat those, maybe the one would also bench. Fine, that's that's Rabbi Gamliel's view. The the rabbis, the main view says, You have may say one blessing. Me'inshalosh means like one blessing that summarizes the three. This is what uh, is colloquially known as um, which is uh, one says it's a it's like one paragraph instead of you know one blessing instead of three or four, and it summarizes the other blessings. But the point is, it's not the real benching. It's not Birkat Amazon. On most views, this is only rabbinically mandated, not biblically. And why? Because it doesn't, you don't fully qualify. It doesn't count as, as uh, you know, you're not, you're not high even bench, to bench. You're not biblically obligated to say Birkat Amazon on eating just fruits. Um, they don't spell this out here, but it's implied one needs to eat bread. One needs to eat bread, meaning, uh, uh, you know, uh, wheat or barley and related, related uh, grains. That's uh, that's uh, processed and made into bread. Otherwise, one doesn't bench. That's the Chachamim's view. And now we have Rabbi Akiva's view, which is fascinating. We're going to think about this for a little while. Rabbi Akiva Omer, um, Afilu Achal Shelek. 
no. Even if one eats shalak, which is cooked vegetables, okay? Meaning not even one of the fruits that Israel is known for. It's just vegetables. It's, you know, it's, I guess it's a main dish. You can, you know, some people, um, uh, some people all the time and all people at least, or just about all people, some of the time have, can have a, a real meal on vegetables. So as long as achal shalak, no. If you eat cooked vegetables and that's your meal, Right? I think it doesn't mean like a snack, you know, uh, but if you have a real meal of vegetables, you may, you bench, you say the three blessings on vegetables. That's Rabbi Kiva's view, right? Uh, Rabbi Kiva, very influential, important Tana. That's his view. And now, as usual, we rule like the Chachamim. We rule like the majority view that says that vegetables are certainly not sufficient. And even the fruits of the land of Israel are not sufficient for benching. One needs to eat, one needs to eat uh, bread in order to be obligated in benching. That is the way that we rule, as we'll see. But uh, it's, you know, these are, this range of views is very interesting. And we're gonna look into it a little bit more. Um, and then the Mishnah goes on to say something else, which is also fascinating. Hashotem mayim litzma'o, if one drinks water because they're thirsty, you say a shahako, that blessing before drinking it. Ritarfan says you say the blessing, um, I think uh, later on it's mentioned that some people, the, the, and this is our, this is the standard practice view, is to say a shakol before and the Borei Nefashot after. But what's sort of funny is this language of litzma'o, if one drinks water because they're thirsty, as opposed to what? So hold that thought, and let's look at a few lines from the Gemara. All right, continuing down in source number eight here. So the Gemara says, my tama de Rabban Gamliel. What's the logic of Rabban Gamliel? Rabban Gamliel, remember, was the view of fruits. But right? if you eat fruits, you say Rabban Gamliel. Dichtiv, Eretz Chita Usora, Begefen Utem Navarimon, Eretz Zeit Shemun Uzbash, right? Including those three fruits and several others. Uchtiv, Eretz Asher Lo Bemeskin Utochal Balechem, all right, a land in which you will not eat bread only in poverty, but you'll you'll have whatever you want. Uchtiv, Ve'achal Tav Vesavata, Ve'achta Adashem Lokecha. And it says, and these citations are all within a few verses of each other. They're all in the same section. And it says, you eat, you're full, you should bless God. So you eat and you're full, you're eat from eating what? From eating, the, the different seven, uh, those seven uh, species, including fruits. So even if one only has fruit, one still should bench. That's from Gamaliel's view. Virabanan, what do the rabbis think? Eretz, hifzika inyan. Well, no, it's, you know, it's maybe it's a few verses, it's within a few verses, but if we say the word Eretz a few times, that sort of breaks things up. You know, so we say Eretz Asher Lobos Fine, we're already talking about a different topic, and Vechatav Savata has nothing to do with the list of fruits. Um, so that's their view. So don't bother me with the the list of the seven fruits. That has nothing to do with this. Verum Lil Nami Eretz Yisuka Inyan. So what does Verum Lil say? Doesn't the word Eretz break it up? Ahumi Bayi Le Maute Akoses Etachita. Fine, he needs the word Eretz to teach that one who um, one who's chewing grain but is not eating like a finished product like bread um, doesn't bench. Find whatever he uses the, the word for a different purpose. Amar Rabbi Yaakov Bar Idi, Amar Rabbi Hanina. So, um, fine. And so now we have a different teaching, right? Rabbi Yaakov, son of Idi, in the name of Rabbi Hanina. Haminim. Anything that comes from the five species, meaning the five species of grain, meaning uh, wheat, barley, spelt rye, and something else, uh, the five species of grain. Uh, you make a mizonot before. Um, Afterwards, you say, a uh, blessing, uh, 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 as it's called, meaning not the benching, but a short version. This is sort of dra draws fully from our Mishnah, right? The Chachamim say on fruits, one makes this uh, single blessing instead of the full benching, and he extends it to eating uh, uh, grain, right? The uh, other, the uh, the grain uh, two of the seven species. Fine. Amar Rabba Bar Mari, Amar Yeshua and Levi, Koshu Mishivata Minim, Anything of the seven species, meaning including all these fruits, you make a ha'etz when you eat it, and a and a ala uh, or ala perot in this case after you eat it. Fine, and this is the standard view as it's codified that um, if you're having if you're having uh, something from the five species that's not bread, you make a mezonot and the ala michia. If you have something from the five species that is bread, you bench, and if you have fruit, you make a ha'etz before. And, uh, you know, of the seven, seven fruits of the land of Israel, you make a ha'etz before, and then you make a uh, ala perot afterwards. So that's, that's the basic source. That's the basic dispute in terms of the view of Rabbi Gamliel and the Chachamim. But what about Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Akiva? 
Even if someone eats cooked vegetables. And so now we ask a question. The Gemara asks with incredulity and apologies to any vegetarians who may be on this uh, Zoom. Can it really be? Is there such a thing as uh, baked vegetables that are food? Can it be? Uh, in Amar of Ashi, uh, it's, uh, it's the uh, head of cabbage. Um, so, uh, so cabbage, this is very traditional if you're from Eastern Europe or something. This is, this is very, this Gemara is very traditional. Baked cabbage, that can be a meal, right? You can have, uh, you're good. There's a lot, of, a lot of meals that are baked cabbage. I don't know about other vegetables, that maybe not. But at least this, you know, there is some vegetarian meal. If we, if we think really hard, we can come up with one, says the Gemara. But again, that, this is sort of a technical point. But what it, what it emphasizes is this definition of uh, that it needs to be mizono or mizone as, as the Aramaic has it, right? Really, key is not that any vegetable, it's not an objective definition that eating vegetables leads to benching. That's not the point. What is the standard? Let's take a step back. According to these opinions, there's really three opinions, right? The Chachamim, bread, uh, uh, there's Rabbi, Rabbi Gamliel, these seven items, and Rabbi Akiva, uh, even, even baked vegetables. What is, I don't want those details. I want a principle. What's the principle for what leads one, the type of food that leads one to be obligated in Birkat Amazon? What's the What's the organizing principle here? Why does, what, what sort of food does one need to eat in order to have to bench? What's it based on? What's the, what's the mechaev? What's the trigger of the obligation to bench according to each of these three views? And there may be more than one right answer. But what do people sustaining, think? Sustaining, sustaining food. Sustaining food, according to who? The humazone. That, that says to me, this is food that, that you're eating as you're sustaining this. Okay, so I think you said sustaining both in both formulations, but you, I think you used it in slightly different ways. So one, one way of thinking about sustenance is that certain foods are defined objectively as sustaining foods. And then Susan, I think the second thing you said is if it's the sort of food that is sustaining you, right? Which is, a, is more subjective. So which of those would you go with? Uh, I, I think I was going with the latter, that if, you, if, if all you can afford is canned beans every day, then that's your sustaining food. And there's no, the, it would be unthinkable that you would never come under the ob obligation to bench because that's what's sustaining you. And God is ultimately the one sustaining you. And therefore that should be the thing that should make you have to bench. Okay, great. And you would say this within one, uh, one, one opinion in particular, all the opinions, some Surely the one that says a filu uh, shil shilka or whatever that was called. Right, certainly Rabbi Akiva. It sounds like Rabbi Akiva's view is if something is vihu mizo, no, it's your food. It's what you eat. Or maybe it sustains you, however exactly you define that. But it, it's, it sounds like it's a subjective factor. If this is your meal, if this for you is a meal, then you bench, right? And maybe like, you know, if you're, uh, if you're a big meat eater, so then, uh, or if you're a big bread eater, then this wouldn't work. But if you're if you're a person who eats a lot of vegetables as your main meal, then it would work. It sounds like right that that seems like if this is a meal to you subjectively, that is a cause for Birkat Amazon. It sounds like that's where we keep his view. Okay, what are some of the other views? What are some of the other principles that work here? Rabban Gamriel says it should be one of the fruits of Eretz Israel. Okay, right. Rabban Gamliel seems to think it. It doesn't really matter what you think. What matters is there's an objective set of criteria. The exact and the number one. And number two, the objective criteria are, is it a fruit of the land of Israel, right? And of course, this makes a lot of sense because as we discussed yesterday, right, the, the second bracha of benching and, and a major theme in the biblical depiction of Birkan Amazon is the land of Israel. So really, I guess on this view, central and definitional to benching is, is the land of Israel. And if, if your fruits are not the fruits that come from the land of Israel, it's not worth benching. And if they are fruits from the land of Israel, then you have to bench. It's that simple, right? That's the single determinant factor. Is this a fruit of the land of Israel? That's at least one way of understanding uh, Rabbi Gamliel's view, um, right? So it's objective, number one. And number two, the objective criterion is, is this a fruit of the land of Israel? Okay, great. Other, other thoughts? And uh, also, let me just make a general point. Um, everyone is welcome to weigh in generally and also welcome to put things on the chat. Um, but if, if uh, you're going to disagree with someone directly, um, uh, let's try to do it politely. And, and generally, uh, chat's not the best place to do that. Um, okay. Um, other, other thoughts? Robert Gamaliel has a point. Because 
basically what we're, we're being told here is our Aretatova, our Shanatan Loch. In fact, the Ramban has difficulty in his parish on the Chumash with saying, on what basis do you say Birchat Tamazon outside of Eretz Israel altogether? And he says, well, it's some kind of Kabbalah, but he realizes that there's really no basis for imposing Birchat Tamazon on food that does not grow in Eretz Israel. Okay, it has to be something that comes. So, Rabbi, I, 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 if, if the Torah lists the fairies, what the items are, then I would think that that makes at least as much sense as saying, in fact, what, why, what's left I'm coming from? Because it starts off with Eretz Chita Usa Ara. Then it proceeds to list all these fruits. The Gefen Utena Verimon Eretz Zeit Shemen Udvash. So, if you just look at that pasuk, you would assume that bread is no different than the fruits that grow out of the ground in Eretz Israel. All those things would require birchat tamazon. On what basis do you make a distinction between a piece of bread and a grape? If anything, the grape is a higher level because it's you know more tasty, more delicious, more luscious. Something you'd be more thankful for. Okay. Okay, thank you for sharing that. So we have a strong endorsement of, of uh, Rabbi Gamliel. And um, right, as was mentioned, like th there, there is what to endorse the view. It's certainly reading the Pesukim. Although, as we saw in the Gemara, the Rabban and the rabbis have a way of parrying that by saying, Eretz er er Hifzika Inyan, right? The, the list of the seven fruits, that's before, that's not really in context. The context is something else. What we don't have, I don't think we've heard anyone suggest yet an explanation for what the principle is for the Chachamim. And keep in mind, uh, these chachamim, these rabbis, this, this is how we paskin. This is what's, this is the authoritative view uh, in, in Jewish law. So what is the trigger? What is the standard uh, for which one, that, you know, uh, food that one eats, the type of food, not the amount, the type of food that one eats leads to benching? Is the what's their principle? The food in the Tanakh is lechem. You don't basically say ochel. Ochel is something you buy in a store. Once in a while, ochel tish peru mehem v'achal tam. In other words, 90% of the uses of the word lechem in the Tanakh, and it's used hundreds of times, it does not mean bread, unless you have a modifying adjective like kikar lechem, do you, see, lechem. do you see the word lechem in this context at all, Yehudi? In, in what context are you saying, Rabbi? The context of what we've been studying, source number eight here. I'm talking about the Torah. Um, well, we're talking about source number eight. Let's focus. And um, so why, what's the view of the Chachamim? Why do the Chachamim think that one needs to eat um, bread, whatever word you use for it in Hebrew? We can leave that for another dis a discussion for another time. Whatever the, the food is, that, um, whatever, but bread, only bread, one makes birkat amazon, only uh, chita and seora, and not fruits and not anything else. What could be the explanation for the Chachamim? How would they, and how may they get that from our verse? Oh, so you're saying Eretz Hashalom with Miskenu Tochal Balechem. That's fine. Okay, so that's an interesting thought, right? The next verse, Hashalom Miskenu Tochal Balechem, it mentions Lechem in the next verse, and maybe that's that's what ties it in. And I think that the Gemara itself implies that. It doesn't say it explicitly, but it says Eretz Hifzika Inyan, right? The word Eretz sort of blocked, stopped, stopped the discussion. And then the new discussion is, as you just said, you the Eretz Hashalom Miskenu Tochal Balechem, you'll eat bread, not, uh, not, not in poverty. Dot, 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 Bechot, that's all one, one stream going straight, and that's why it's tied specifically to Lechem. That is certainly um, uh, exegetically, could very well be where the rabbis got it from, um, although you'd have to understand what Lechem is, right? Lechem is Lechem bread, or is it food, as you, as you pointed out? So that might be a weakness uh, of that argument, but that could very well be the exegetical hook. What, but what would, moving beyond that, what would be the logic behind it? So you have Lechem in the verse. Right, the bread was the substantive ingredient of a meal, just like in Asia, it would have been rice. And in the Middle East, it was bread. Okay, I, 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 I'm not sure I heard everything you said, but it sounded like you were saying, at least in the Middle East, bread is like definitional of a meal. It's sort of central to cuisine. Yeah. Although it's interesting that in Arabic, lecha means meat. So that shows uh, that in, in that culture, meat is the substantial part of a meal. Maybe right. You'd have to you'd have to look into how many things shifted diachronically as that you know that term. But that, yeah, that'd be an interesting angle to look into. Um, right. Um, yeah. So, 
So yeah, so it seems to me that that's, that's the standard here, right? That why bread? Because bread is sort of the central food, or you can say maybe it's the most, it's the most sustaining, which I think, um, you know, that you can get to different uh, biological arguments or different, you know, the, the way humans digest food. So the thing that's sustaining for a longer, longer term in, in the strongest way is, uh, is carbs. And, uh, you know, the most, the most carbful of the carbs is, uh, is bread. Right. So, I mean, there's a reason why bread or, or as was mentioned, you know, things like rice, um, although rice is sort of downgraded, maybe because it's not natural to the land of Israel. It's not on the list. Maybe there's some co combination there, but bread is really seen as the staple of the diet. And so this would seem to be, again, thinking about our, our standards before for the rabbis, what's the, what's the, what's the basis here? Number one, an objective criterion that it needs to be something that is um, that is, uh, first of all, objective. And number two, what is that objective criterion? It needs to be something that is very much sustaining. The maximally sustaining things, maybe because of the word lechem in the verse, maybe just because of, um, you know, their experience of how people lived, is bread. And that's why only on bread does one make your karamazon. That's the most sustaining thing on that objective standard. Now, what's, so as we saw, there's this interesting there's this interesting divide here between objective and subjective views, right? So Rabbi Akiva is very much subjective. Is it mizo? No. Is this food for him? Not is it food objectively, is this food for him? Whereas the Chachamim say, no, is it, you know, is it sustaining food generally? Is it defined as sustaining food generally? Uh, and Rabbi, and Rabbi Gamliel comes in and says, well, actually, there's a different factor objectively, which is the land of Israel. Really interesting how each one comes at it from a different angle. And, and again, as was mentioned, there may be multiple factors working together. The Chachamim may be not just sustaining food, but sustaining food from the land of Israel, which is why they end up with um, those, those types of grain that are native to the land. Okay, um, some very interesting things here. And now let's just look at the last line in source eight. If one drinks water because they're thirsty, as opposed to what? You know, drinking water, if you're, when you're thirsty, you make a blessing. What, when else do you drink water? As opposed to someone who was choking on... Uh, on uh, on a bone with meat, um, you know, whatever they're choking on something, and they need the bread, and they need bread. They need water to sort of wash it down. In such a case, you don't make a blessing, right? So that's interesting too. We see here again that this subjective function, right? You can be doing the same physical phenomenon. You're taking water and pouring it down your throat, and sometimes that's considered eating in terms of making a blessing. Not a not a birkat mazon, but other blessings. Um, uh, Bereda Fashot and uh, Shakol. Sometimes it counts as, as, as drinking and sometimes it doesn't. It depends on your experience. Is your, are you trying to parch your thirst or um, no, quench your thirst? What am I saying? Are you trying to quench your thirst or are you trying to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, stop yourself from choking? So the same action can be eating or not eating depending on the context. Okay. So any, any questions or any thoughts on, on this source, very important source that we just did? No? Um, okay. Um, trying to figure out if we should do the next source or not. I think maybe we'll find a line or two. Ah, so right. So the, the next source, maybe we'll just summarize outside, is that there was a, a situation where Basically, you're like we're near the middle. Now, a group of rabbis ate together, and um, it happened to be that both Rabbi Gamaliel and Rabbi Akiva were there. And Rabbi Gamaliel offered Rabbi Akiva to bless. They were eating fruits. Rabbi Gamaliel wanted Rabbi Akiva to make a Birkat Amazon because fruit, Rabbi Gamaliel, right? That's Birkat Amazon. And Rabbi Akiva got up and said, not a bet, not the full benching, but just. Uh, a uh, a uh, ala perot or ala michia, the short version. So Rikiva went against not only Rabbi Gamliel's position, but even against his own position. Rikiva, all the more so, should be benching uh, as Rabbi wanted him to, and he didn't. And then they said, "Oh, you know." Then they have a whole discussion: Why are you getting me into a fight? And then Rikiva says, "Yachid v'rabim, halacha k'rabim." When you have a majority versus a minority view, we follow the majority. This is how Jewish law traditionally works. And Rikiva says, "I therefore defer." To the majority, to the chachamim, I won't even bench. I certainly think, in theory, one should bench on eating, on eating uh, fruit. But I will defer to the view of the majority. They say you shouldn't bench, so he didn't bench in the end. Um, so, and then there's a whole discussion going forward. Tosfot, again, Tosfot in their same role, in their dialectical role, raises a contradiction between these sources. And they say, uh, 
um, right that on, on the, the previous source, source number eight. He then looks back at this Gemara at source number nine. He says, Velo dummy, it's not similar to source number nine. The Gamaliel Natan Rashila Rekiva Abrech that Ramagil gave Rekiva permission to bench. He's blessed. He said bench, and Rekiva didn't bench. Why not? The Shani Hacha, the Ikba Mizone Ale. It's different here. It's different in, in source eight because he sets his meal upon it, meaning if you're eating your cooked vegetables as a meal and you're saying, you're, and you're saying, this is my meal, this is my dinner, vegetables, then you bench. If you're not making that your meal, if you just happen to eat cooked vegetables, not as a real set meal, then you don't. So again, this emphasizes further the principle that we saw before, um, that it's about the experience of, of it really being a full meal uh, subjectively. And it doesn't just vary person to person, it varies experience to experience or scenario to scenario. Sometimes you'll be eating to fill yourself up. Sometimes you'll be eating just as a snack or something else. And according to Rikiva, the way Tosa would say it, that determines whether one benches or not. It depends on your experience right then and there, subjectively. Um, I think we're going to skip the next few sources that give other reconciliations, including saying Rabbi Kiva actually was, you know, in both cases would have benched, but he didn't want to go against the majority, at least not publicly. Um, we're not going to go, we're not going to read through those next few sources. They go into some of those details, but everyone should just be aware that that's another, uh, another reconciliation there. But Tosvot is helpful because they clarify, um, you know, some of the, uh, they clarify Rabbi Kiva's position a bit further, right? That it really depends not just on who, uh, but also on the specific time you're eating. Is this a meal for you right here, right now, or not? Which, of course, is similar to the first part of this year, the question of eating, um, the question of one who eats, uh, uh, eats and becomes full or doesn't become full, right? That's subjective, not just person to person, but scenario by scenario. Same thing here for Rabbi Akiva's view. It's, it's uh, situationally subjective. Okay, it looks like we have a question, Yehudi, or a thought. Well, I think... Getting back to where you began on Monday, would you like to say something about the summary of Birchat Tamazon that's contained in what most of the Sidurim call Bracha Achrona? They say, may, uh, Bracha Achat Me'en Shalosh. That's what we'll be discussing all these last half hour. Mm -hmm. But the Shalosh that that Achat is summarizing are not one, two, and three. It's two, three, and four. Take a look and you'll see for yourself there's not one word in it that refers to the first Bracha. What it refers to was the Oretz, then to Yerushalayim, and then, you know, uh, then you finally end up with Atova HaMetiv. It, it finishes up, it starts with Echomi Priyol, it's for me to walk, and it says, Ki Ata Hashem Tovu Metiv Lako, Venodu Lecha Aha Oretz, and Abracha is Aha Oretz. In other words, it makes it very clear as far as they're concerned, Birchat HaMazon starts not with Hazan as Hako, but rather with and the three brachot that they're summarizing are that first, then the Yerushalayim bracha, and then the Hatova HaMetiv bracha. They're acting like Kazana Tako isn't even applicable. Which would mean okay. that Hatova okay. HaMetiv is long, has been around long before Betar. That Betar story is, look, it, you know, there's a lot of stories that Gemara gives to explain things which simply are not historically acceptable. Why would okay. so a very, It's a very, thank you for that. It's a very interesting literary analysis of the al text, uh, but I think people don't have it in front of them. Um, so, and, and that wasn't part of the plan for, for analyzing that text, but it's an interesting possibility worth, worth thinking about. Um, and the historical question also worth thinking about in terms of when the text of al emerged and, and whether that's before or after Betar and how that relates to Rechachah and Shalosh and the rabbi's own historical account of that. These are all interesting questions, um, uh, maybe for a different year though. So I, I think we'll put that on hold, but thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, and I see there's a question in the chat from Sivan that are, it, uh, may it be that the seven types of fruits are more sacred or more precious? So it depends what you mean by that. Um, if you mean more sacred in some formal sense, that like they have some status that's different, there, there are other things that make food uh, sacred or kadosh, um, usually consecration to the temple in one form or other, or consecration uh, to the priestly gifts. So this doesn't have that sort of sanctity, um, but you could say it's more precious, meaning the, um, right, the, the fruits of the land of Israel are more precious, but precisely they, they come from Israel and, uh, and represent the land. Uh, and that presumably would be uh, the logic, part of the logic behind Rabbi Gamaliel's position. So yes, that, that could very well be. Um, okay, any other, any other uh, questions before we go forward? 
Okay. Um, so let's look at source number 13 now, the Rambam. And this is a bit off our precise topic, but it will it will shed light on Rabbi Akiva's view, which is why I brought it in. Um, the Rambam writes, Isa shenefet bekarka. And I don't know the exact logistics of this, but uh, dough that is baked in the ground, kemosha ha'arviim shokhnea midbaro ofim, like the Arabs who live in the desert uh, bake. Okay, so I guess some, there's some sort of Arabian baking in the ground uh, uh, process that the Rambam was aware of. Since it doesn't have the form of bread, maybe it's, um, I don't know, maybe this is something like alafa, although I'm not sure. Uh, it doesn't have the shape of bread. You know, it's not like a, a loaf. It's more like, you know, dough that uh, just got stretched out and baked on a hot rock or something like that. You make a mezonot before, not a hamotzi, not the blessing usually made on bread, but the blessing usually made on non-bread grain uh, foods, mezonot. The im, if you, however, if you set your meal on it, let's say you eat a lot of these, uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, non-bread, non non-bread non form baked grain goods, then if you eat enough of them, if you're having a whole meal on it, then you do bench. So let's just use a practical example. A lot of people say this applies to pizza nowadays. Pizza is not in the form of bread. No one would say that pizza looks like bread. On the other hand, it's made primarily out of grain, right? Uh, the flour and water that go into it. And it's, uh, if you're having your pizza as a meal, then you, you make a hamotzi, right? That's the view that, let's say, if you have two slices or three slices, then that's really a meal, then you bench. Uh, then you or bench and you also make a hamotzi. Whereas if you're having just one slice, maybe that's more of a snack and you wouldn't, even though it's a kezayit, right? It's, it's more than a kezayit, it's probably more than a kebetza too. But uh, since this is not in the form of bread, the standard is slightly different. So the Rambam says you make a hamotzi and presumably you also bench if you set your meal uh, on this non-bread form grain product. Same thing for dough that one mixed in honey or oil or milk or other spices and then baked it. This is known as, um, I don't know how to, how to refer to it exactly, but, uh, you know, some sort of non, uh, non-standard bread, um, you know, uh, uh, flour, uh, grain flour, mishuk, that's not quite bread. What? This is what you call mizona spread. Uh, well, that's a little complicated. So the whole question of how to apply this practically, right? So some, um, there's two opposite phenomena that, that contradict each other and yet are both very common. One is where you'll see um, some people, and this is sociology, so this may or may not be true in your communities, I'll just share what I see, and I think is relatively widespread. People will have, you know, let's say Shabbat lunch, will bring out their bread for hamotzi, and it'll be like, what do they call it, they have like the, the challah fairy, or whatever, they have different companies that, it's like, it basically is dessert, it's basically a chocolate babka that they call challah bread, and they make a hamotzi on it. As far as I can tell, um, you know, if, unless you're, I mean, unless you're really having a meal primarily of that bread, it would seem to be a mizono, just like chocolate babka is mizono, um, on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have a phenomenon of Irma, what you said, is people, let's say you're on an airplane, and you don't want to uh, have to make a hamotzi, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. So they have these quote-unquote mizonos rolls, where they put a little bit of fruit juice in, and they say, this is not bread. It looks and tastes just like bread, or just like a, a bread, a chal roll or a bread roll, but you know, some people say you shouldn't make, you should make a um, Mizonos instead. Um, so I think, uh, as far as I can tell, both of those are incorrect. And um, um, Mizonos, Mizonos rolls are always Hamotzi. And uh, Hamotzi on cake, effectively cake, is, is, should not be done. It should be Mizonos. But anyway, everyone feel free to contact their own authority uh, or figure it out themselves. But that's my view. Uh, this question, how exactly to apply this Rambam, right? The, if you read the Rambam, literally, even if you put a little bit of oil in your challah, that's already not a hamotzi. That, that doesn't seem to be the way we take it. The way we understand it generally is that I think, you know, in terms of most communities, and there is a little bit of a variety of, of application, but the standard view seems to be if it's bread, if it's seen culturally as bread, then it's bread. If it's seen culturally as something else, then it's something else. And it's, then it's a, a cake or something in Mizono. So a little bit of oil, a little bit of sugar in your, in your bread, it's still bread. If you make your bread into something that literally looks like a piece of cake, then you can call it challah if you want, but it's not, it's still not bread. No one would call that bread. And uh, again, a little bit of fruit juice in your bread, it's still bread. That's, uh, that, that's I think the standard view, although maybe some people diverge. And um, right, and then the question about the shape, 
So like, is the whole question as to matzah, like let's say square matzahs that, um, is, does that count as bread or not? So that seems to be Ashkenazim generally rule that it does. Sephardim generally rule that it does not, except on Pesach, because then that's the most bread you can have. Um, but anyway, there are a lot, a lot of other discussions we can have here. Um, but let's just jump to the end of this, of this halacha here. Um, yeah. Even though it's bread, it's not fully bread, but it's bread-ish. Um, right? It doesn't have the shape of bread, but it still is sort of bread. You make a mizono. If you, set, if you have your whole meal based on this, right? If, unless you have for lunch. What are you eating for lunch? I'm eating a chocolate babka for lunch. The entire, the entire babka. Right? You're having a whole meal out of it, and there's a sheer, a certain amount that one has to eat. If, if you're having a whole meal out of it, then you make a hamotzi, and the Rama doesn't spell this out, but you also would bench afterwards. So we see here, this is not quite Rabbi Akiva's view. It's pretty, it's different in several ways, but it's parallel to Rabbi Akiva's view in the following way. Whether one benches or not, or whether one makes hamotzi or mizono, depends on whether one is kovea suza, whether one makes a whole meal out of it or not. Right, again, a subjective factor as to whether one makes a meal out of this food or not. It's not exactly bread. It's, it's similar to bread in some ways. Um, so what will determine whether you bench is whether you make a meal out of it. Similar to Rabbi Kiva that this is a vegetable, but whether you bench or not is whether you make a meal out of it. And also similar in some ways to the case of water, right? Whether you make, there's it's a bracha beforehand. Also, whether you make a bracha on the water or not depends on whether you're drinking it because you're thirsty or whether you're drinking, drinking it because uh, you're, you know, you need to clear your throat. Fine. We're going to skip the next few sources and jump to practical application. We'll start with a, a Twitter joke from my friend Ellie, and this will get us into some of the practical ramifications. The non-Jewish equivalent to not wanting to eat bread because you have to wash and bench is not wanting to eat an orange because you have to peel it, which may be a deep insight into the human condition, but certainly is uh, a reflection of this phenomenon that some have um, of, uh, you might call, uh, washophobia, or the fear of having bread because you have to wash and that takes time. You have to find the place to watch, and then you have to bench, and that takes time. So some people are like, do you want to have a sandwich for lunch? Oh, no, then I have to bench. I don't want a sandwich. I'll have something else, right? This is a phenomenon that some of us may have encountered, um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's washophobia, and there's flashophobia. Flashophobia we can discuss another time. This is just, that's fear of becoming flashy, because then you can't have ice cream afterward. This is washophobia, which is its own, uh, its own phenomenon, and here is an important reflection, I think important, by Raviol Ben Nun, who's a, a, a rabbi in Israel today. Um, I remember studying this with him when I was in yeshiva 15 years ago. Um, and it wasn't, it was only a Torah Shabbat It was only something he would teach orally. I didn't, I, I couldn't find it written anywhere despite searching. And since then he's published it in, in a short form so we can read his words together and uh, see what he thinks about this phenomenon of, uh, of washophobia, fear of having bread because then one has to wash and bench and that's uh, annoying or something like that. So he says, mazon gamim lo Benching, saying grace after meals, even if you didn't have bread. And this is sort of a subtitle. Ochlim lechem. Right, poor people eat bread, or bread is sort of, you know, cheap and filling. Yom yom. They remember their challenge daily. Ochlim basar Rich people, people who can afford it, have a lot of meat. They fill themselves on meat, and they forget about God because they don't bench, because you don't bench on meat. And then this is a social commentary. Then they have these debates about uh, about uh, you know crisis in, in society with the lower economic echelons. Um, they they talk about that a lot, but they don't actually think about God in their own lives. That's his headline. Okay, let's read his piece. Um, so he says, in literary context, the Torah goes from discussing the different dangers of war. We talked about this a bit last time. It talks about the dangers of success in the good land. Eretz Nachleimayim, a land full of rivers. Eretz Shivat Haminim, the land of the seven species. Machtsevim, you can you can uh, uh, you can mine uh, precious minerals. We can quickly forget that hazardous hazardous path of leaving Egypt. You eat. Um, all right, you, you eat uh, the manna in the desert. Totally depends on God. And you end up with this pride, with this uh, focus on your own wealth and your own success. Right? I made my wealth based on my own strength. That is the risk. We, we talked about this on Monday. 
Shumata Torah the Sakanazo, he Birkatamazon, the Torah's response to this danger is benching Ha Bracha Yechidasha Tramachayavit Bifirush, the only blessing explicitly commanded by the Torah, as we pointed out. It's not even clear that the Torah commands it, but according to Rav Yoel, the Torah commands blessing. Fine. It's not just a blessing on the food. Look at the verse. Um, right? You have to remember the good land and what led to it, leaving Egypt, the whole story. The second blessing, about the land, that's also necessary. You don't fulfill your obligation. And now he says, our, our world is very similar to the world that the Torah is warning against. We, we exist today exactly in the same situation. We still are fighting wars against nations around us. Obviously, he's speaking to an Israeli audience here. We live in good and, and nice houses, many of us. We eat to our fill out of the, the land that uh, the the, grow, the the produce that grows in our land. Another uh, recent news, right there. I think Israel has found a lot of gas, natural gas in the Mediterranean. We have natural resources. We're in great shape. What are you having for dinner? We're having steak. What are you having for dinner? We're having salmon for dinner. Right? You have a whole meal, just meat. Of course, that's a lot more expensive than having a meal that's than having, I don't know, chowin, right? You have one small piece of meat and that's a meal for 10 people, right? It's a lot, that's a lot cheaper than having everyone eating a steak. That's the most expensive thing, everyone eating a steak. You have these super fancy meals. They say, okay, so we're going to bench. We're going to thank God for, you know, allowing us to have this great success where we can all afford to have steak for dinner. No, I didn't have bread. I don't need a bench. I'll mumble one line and then go home. Uh, right, so this is exactly what, Rav Yol is critiquing. I think, if I recall, in person, uh, when he gave the shiur, he, I mean, he had more than whatever, 500 words or 300 words. He was a lot more uh, animated and, and critical, but this is his short version of the critique. We didn't have bread, we don't need a bench, and we can continue living in, ironically, living in a ve- very well-to-do lives, but without, uh, without uh, remembering God. When do you bench? You bench on Shabbos because you need to have bread for, for, this, for the meals, but you don't eat bread during the week and you have a bench. He says you have to bench on eating food. You're only biblically obligated if you're full. He didn't say bread, he says food. If you're eating a meal, you have your steak and you make a bread, you should at least say the brach of no de. God, we thank you for the land. Don't say the brach at the end. There's no brach levatal. But to say the content of know that to remind yourselves. And then it, it, the irony the, the, that uh, poor people who can't afford a steak, uh, they, they eat bread, bread, you know, a basic staple, relatively cheap. They remember the crisis. They remember their dependence on God. Whereas rich people eat steak and they never, they never actually recognize God in their lives. And then they have all discussion about social justice. Oy la busha, he says. Woe to the embarrassment. A deep, deep criticism. And I'll add, remember, think about the, the opinions in the Mishnah, right? We had, what do you bench on? Either bread or fruit or vegetables. Why did no one raise the option of benching on, I don't know, fish, on steak? Because it just was not even, it wasn't even a thought. No one ate steak then. It was like the idea of having a meal of steak only exists in, in a world where you have so, mu- so many animals that are available. It used to be maybe once in a blue moon, you'd have, you'd have meat. You know, and then you'd save it for as long as you can. It's not like they had um, uh, animals processed at the rate that we have, where someone could eat steak every meal of their lives, and that's and that's financially feasible uh, for 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 many people. It didn't even it wasn't even an option. Now things have gone full circle. You know, for many people, we're you know we're we're financially comfortable enough, and our society has progressed to the point, progressed or not, you call it what you want, where we can just we can always eat meat, at, or at least chicken, certainly chicken, right? Um, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's healthy, it's fancy, it's, and, and, and well, it's just a shahakal and a boring of so you forget about God and you don't need to do anything. And, and so Raviola is very opposed to that. He doesn't say it in this article, but, um, when I studied with him, he said he, you know, he was suggesting not in practice, but he was suggesting at least in theory that we should think more seriously about Rabbi Akiva's position. If you eat whatever your meal is, that should be reason enough to bench. If your meal is a steak, 
that's not, oh, it's just a steak. I don't need a bench. No, that should be a reason to bench. So here I think is his compromise to say, you know, to do it without, without uh, the bracha parts. So there's no bracha. That's all. There's no unnecessary bracha. But to at least remember the content, this is his compromise. But he, he traced it back to Rabbi Akiva's view. So even though Rabbi Akiva's view is not halakhically determinative, it wasn't accepted by the later generations, that conception of thinking not just, not objectively, you know, is this food, the type of food that one benches on, but subjectively, is this a meal for me, is actually a better way in some ways, from some perspective, is better at getting at the root problem that led to benching in the first place. If the root problem of benching is people being overconfident and not realizing their dependence on God, then the fact that something is your meal actually is more important than whether it's objectively a certain type of food or not. And therefore he embraces, at least in, in a compromise view, this idea of, of going with the uh, going with the food that's that one considers one's own meal. Certainly, if it's you know expensive, fancy, fancy foods, um, one should go with that rather than with the objective standard. I uh, about a decade ago, I wrote this article about Reviel Benun's halachic methodology in general. Uh, so, if you if you want, feel free to look at that. Basically, he's very much a believer in in uh, in the reason for the law rather than the formal structure of the law. So here he goes back to the original reason for Bekat Amazon, which is not to forget God. And if that's the case, that's, you know, that in some ways we should try to make that more central than questions of, is it bread or not? He focuses more, therefore, more on the subjective aspects than the objective. But what we saw today was in a few different contexts, this question of subjective versus objective in determining whether one needs to bench. Is, is one full or not? Versus the standard of, is this a kazaid or a kibetza? That's one big question. And then our other question of what foods qualify? Is there some objective food? This is considered filling, bread. Or this is the land of Israel's. Uh, fruits, or is it something that make is one's own meal? This is my meal, whether it's uh, baked vegetables, cooked vegetables, or whether it's uh, steak. If it's my meal, that's reason enough to bench. Reviel makes a strong argument, even though the you know the the halakhically uh, halakhic determinant halakhically determined position is that it needs to be bread. Objectively, Reviel says we shouldn't forget about the subjective side either, especially given the reason for Rikata Mazon, which is about remembering God even in our success. So with that, I'll pause. Happy to take questions. Again, we're uh, we're past time, so you know, no, feel no pressure to stay. But if people have questions, happy to discuss that uh, now. Okay. If not, I think uh, Sarah has uh, announcements about uh, other upcoming classes, and uh, and I'll stick around. Great. Thank you. Yes, we have a spiel to send off. Thank you to everyone for being here. Um, thank you to Rabbi Dr. Zuckier for a a, a very interesting class. Um, plug for the rest of our Winters Mon programming. Our next session will be tonight at 8 p.m. by Rabbi Yadidya Greenberg on poultry farming and shechita. Um, you can find out more information about this class as well as all of our programming for this week and next week um, at www.drisha.org classes. So again, thank you everyone for the opportunity to learn with you and I can't wait to see you again soon.